Thanks for joining us today. I wanted to start first and uh, really just honor and thank our healthcare workers, our doctors, our nurses, all the medical staff uh, that are on the front lines helping us through this crisis and taking care of our uh, COVID-19 patients all across the state. Uh, they're doing a wonderful job and we're just continuing to pray for their, uh, their safety and uh, we've been visiting their hospitals and we're doing everything we can to support them. They're doing great. Um, you know, right now people are really, really anxious about this. A uh, lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. Um, but I'm just here to tell Oklahomans we are going to get through this. Um, we are doing a fantastic job of our social distancing. And so uh, just continue to follow the guidelines. That's when we're trying to give updates every single day uh, to let you know what's happening. But uh, Oklahomans are doing a really good job. We're taking this very, very seriously. But the reason we're here today is to uh, update Oklahomans on how we're expanding our ability to perform COVID-19 testing uh, all across our state. Uh, Oklahoma State University's research lab in Stillwater received 10,000 reagents or test kits uh, yesterday. And I was in Stillwater. I wanted to put my eyes on them and, and uh, see that test, uh, see those 10,000 cases uh, that came in. So now um, we have that ability to test 10,000 right here in the state of Oklahoma. I want to specifically thank President Burns Hargis, uh, also Secretary Casey Shrum, uh, all the faculty, the staff, the graduate assistants at Oklahoma State who worked around the clock to pull this off really quickly as we're competing for these uh, test kits against all other states. Uh, Oklahoma State did a great job of, uh, of getting those in. Um, Oklahomans should be proud of the work all of our research universities are doing uh, through this unprecedented situation. Right now, uh, we have three different labs that are able to do COVID-19 testing in the state. We, we have the uh, state health department, we have Oklahoma State University, and we have the University of Oklahoma all able to perform COVID-19 testing in the state of Oklahoma. <clears throat> I've also instructed experts at our research universities to come together with our state epidemiologists, our state health department uh, to perfect the modeling and help booster and confirm all the model that we're doing that is predicting our hospital needs, our ICU, our ventilator needs um, in, the, in, the, in hospital capacity that we're going to need as we're affected and impacted by COVID-19. Uh, we're also rolling out mobile screening sites uh, all across our state, and I'll let Secretary Lockridge tell you a little bit about that in, in just a few minutes. Uh, before I turn it over to Secretary Shrum, I want to remind Oklahomans how important it is to follow the CDC guidelines. Uh, there's, you know, social distancing. Uh, we have to make sure that we keep our distance from others. That's the best way to keep this from sp spreading because some folks uh, will not have symptoms, uh, but it's so important that through this time we keep our social distancing. Uh, we avoid groups of 10 or more. We sign that executive order. Uh, we, we stay at home when possible. We sign an executive order for our vulnerable population all the way through April 30th. Uh, to, uh, they're safer at home, and unless they need to be out for essential travel, uh, going to the pharmacy or the grocery store, we know that that vulnerable population is safer at home. And I know that this is a, a very difficult time for our state. Uh, so many of you are at home watching or listening to this broadcast right now. Uh, but remember, we're going to get through this. Uh, but for the time being, we have to keep our social distancing. We've got to follow all of the recommendations. Uh, and it's my goal to get Oklahoma back to a regular uh, life as soon as possible. If we all pull together in this time, uh, we, we can prevent the prolonged uh, pain to our state, both from the virus and from the economic stranglehold uh, that happens, that's happening through this. So we will get through this together. Oklahoma is going to come out of this stronger. Thank you for taking this seriously, Oklahomans. I'm hearing from all across the state how businesses are, we're working from home, we're innovating, we're, we're coming up with new ideas of how to keep the social distancing. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Secretary of Science and Innovation, uh, Dr. Casey Shrum, to talk to you more about the testing capacity. Dr. Shrum. Thank you, Governor Stitt. 
Uh, we were very pleased with the progress we made yesterday in receiving the reagents into the state. Uh, expanding our testing capabilities are, are vitally important and foundational to our success in, in managing this crisis and seeing that, that occur yesterday uh, as a part of our go moving forward strategy that we are, we are staying on our timelines um, and, and moving forward, working through both commercial and federal avenues to obtain uh, the very important reagents. Uh, the, the collaboration between the State Health Department, OSU, and OU are, are the important piece of this. Uh, they are working together all as one State Department of Health laboratory and meeting daily to work through uh, each day um, how to operationalize and better uh, turn around lab times, get tests out uh, to Oklahomans more quickly. Um, as a part of really just clarifying what occurred yesterday, I know there's been a lot of questions around what is a test kit, uh, what, what happened in, you know, in Stillwater. Um, so to clarify, if your provider orders a test for you, that is a nasal swab that is done, and that, that specimen is sent to one of the state labs for testing. Now, what occurred yesterday is that in order to run and process a lab, you have to have what is called reagent. That's a very important piece of material. All states across the United States have been struggling trying to get that reagent in order to run the labs. And so regardless of where you live in Oklahoma, our goal is to turn around those lab times. You still get your test performed wherever your provider is, but through our three uh, sites of our state testing lab, we will be able to uh, do those tests Right here in Oklahoma, our goal is to turn those around within 24 hours. Now our testing priority is going to continue to be hospitalized patients because it's very important that we know the status of hospitalized patients so that we're not burning through uh, protective equipment for our, our frontline healthcare workers unnecessarily. We're still going to be focusing on testing those vulnerable populations and healthcare workers. But as we expand our testing capabilities, our goal is to really get those out there into the communities so that we can um, identify those positive cases in beginning uh, isolation and slowing down the, the transmission. The questions are how, you know, how do you get tested? Uh, if, if you're an Oklahoman and you are symptomatic, you should contact your, your healthcare provider um, let them know what your symptoms are, and they will help you in the screening process and guide you through that, whether you need testing or not. If you do not have a health care provider, uh, you can contact an emergency room, but please call ahead and uh, call through the hospital. We want to make sure that, that uh, we know what patients are coming in and with what symptoms, so we're not unnecessarily exposing others um, to the virus. If you're not symptomatic, but you know that you have been exposed, to a, a patient who has tested positive for the COVID virus, you need to go ahead and begin self-quarantine immediately and contact your provider. They will assess uh, your, their, your situation and advise you of your need for testing. But it is so important that if you believe you're exposed to quarantine yourself. But I, in, in all, I believe that what's most important and what we need from all Oklahomans is for you to help us decrease the transmission of the virus. Sadly, we know that we have lost Oklahoman lo Oklahomans to, to this virus, and we know and can anticipate that this will continue to happen. And so I implore you to follow the CDC guidelines, stay at home when you can, and um, monitor if you have symptoms, start your self-quarantine. It is, it is vitally important and we are relying on you to help us slow the transmission of the virus so that we can be prepared and um, our health care workers will have the capabilities to take care of your family and friends and loved ones if they should need it. Thanks, Dr. Shrem, for that explanation. If I could, I'd like to provide a little context on our satellite or our mobile locations. So as we stand now, we have two locations that are uh, staffed, stood up, manned by our Oklahoma City, County, and Tulsa City, County Health Departments. Uh, we have a close collaborative partnership with those two entities, uh, and as we speak, their two locations, again, are manning and staffing testing for Oklahoma and Tulsa counties. 
Um, in addition to that, the state stood up at the first part of this week two other satellite locations, one in Kay County and one in Pittsburgh County. And I wanted to describe in a little bit of detail the purpose of those. Um, our testing capacity has expanded by virtue of the work of Dr. Shrum and her colleagues, which has truly been exemplary and extraordinary in terms of alleviating uh, really global uh, disruptions to the supply chain. But the satellite locations were not aimed at increasing testing. They were aimed at two particular purposes. One, to give us a sense of what was happening in populations outside of Tulsa County and Oklahoma County. That we've been able to do on a limited basis uh, to get a sense of transmission rates and the like in those locations. And in addition, uh, what it allowed us to do was to get some practice on standing up mobile locations uh, that we can now replicate across the state, most particularly in rural areas. By doing this in Kay County and in Pittsburgh County, we've now developed a model that can swiftly be spun up and moved to other locations. And within the next four days, we will have moved those two locations out to the western part of the state, one in the northwestern quadrant and one in the southwestern quadrant, which will continue to allow us to practice, to hone our ability, and then to address uh, outbreaks that might occur in our rural locations. Now, what happened to those two in Kay and Pittsburgh County is those were subsumed by the existing county health networks, of which Oklahoma has 68 that are strong and robust uh, and have been practicing for outbreaks for years and years and years. So this effort for satellite or mobile testing has just been uh, to supplement and to amplify what existed uh, through our already functioning uh, county health departments. Uh, we wanted to provide that bit of context uh, to clarify uh, on some misunderstanding of what might have happened. Uh, the actual physical way that these happen uh, in the satellite clinics is they are indeed drive-through. Uh, they will swab individuals who are referred uh, by virtue of their symptoms, and then the tests will go back uh, to our testing labs already referenced by Dr. Shrum. Um, so these will be appearing again in the northwest and southwest parts of our state to augment both our testing um, capability, our reach, uh, and then also to make sure that we're reaching our rural community as well. Uh, I believe at this time uh, we're turning it over to questions, Governor? Yes, that'd be great. Carmen Foreman, you're open for a question. Oh, uh, I'm not sure I had a question at this time. Did I raise my hand? Sorry. Awesome. Uh, Sean Murphy. Oh, <clears throat> thanks. Um, Governor, um, I'm kind of curious why the uh, state epidemiologist is not uh, attending these briefings anymore. Uh, you know, he's probably working on modeling right now. We also have, uh, I've brought in Oklahoma State and the University of Oklahoma to help perfect the modeling, uh, but we can get him uh, involved. Uh, if you've got specific questions for him, we'd be happy to get him involved. But right now I have them uh, kind of hold up uh, perfecting the modeling because that's going to determine our hospital needs, our ICU needs, our um, ventilator capacity. And so really, uh, I've, I've given uh, the state epidemiologist, OU, OSU, uh, we have to challenge, we have to get that number right, and, and I've, I've given everybody through, through Monday to kind of come up with that, uh, uh, with those final numbers for me. So I'm sure he's, he's holed up uh, doing what modelers do right now. Janelle Steckline. My question is, there's a, percep there's a perception that um, some of the early tests were reserved for those with uh, political influence or people who had money or were well-connected. Um, is that going to change? Uh, you, first of all, do you agree with that perception and is, are tests going to be more widely available now that we have more of them? Okay. Well, I would say that, you know, the, the goal of any testing and through the state lab uh, our focus here is what occurs at the state lab, and the state lab is intended to focus on the hospitalized patients, vulnerable populations, and healthcare workers. And then as we move forward, uh, we will continue to expand that capacity as we have outbreaks. Um, what occurs at uh, private labs or ordered through physicians, um, I don't believe I can comment on, but I can comment to the, the um, strategy and the goals of the state lab. And just to, just to add on to that, that, that's why we're here is to let Oklahomans know we now have 10,000 uh, test kits available within the state's control of OU, OSU, or the State Department of Health. 
uh, but great point. There were there's uh, there's private labs all over that hospitals would send out. The turn times could be up to seven days, and that's why it was so critical. That's why we were really pushing to get our test case kits here, uh, so we can. If in Dr. Shrum, we we can turn these test kits around now in five hours. So that's really significant for our healthcare workers, for our hospital needs. So we're not burning through the protective equipment. Yeah. Um, Dylan Richards, open for a question. And then we'll go, okay, to Ben Felder. Yeah, Governor, you said we're competing with other states for the test. Can, can you speak to what steps you and your team are taking to improve Oklahoma's ability to get more tests? And, and Dr. Shum was just credited for her work on this front. What exactly does that work involve? Yeah, so as we, we were looking at, as the governor stated, that there is a, is a shortage of reagents. Um, through the federal government, the state health departments are allocated uh, testing materials, but as you can see across the United States, uh, we're, we're all trying to get a hold of that depending on the platform. And so very early on, I brought on um, Deputy Secretary Pollard, uh, and she and I have looked at what are our capabilities to go out to the commercial uh, laboratories, um, also to look at what were the platforms that we had here in the state. And, and what, who was supplying those particular platforms. And what we found was um, we were looking for uh, companies that had their, their manufacturing here in the United States that we may have had um, current um, contracts with because if you have a current contract and you are already receiving supplies from that company, you become a priority. So we have not given up on, on going after the supply through FEMA. We're pushing that direction. But we also have a strategy about what testing uh, platforms both uh, OU, OSU, and the state health department have, and, and really looking at the supply chain to understand what companies we needed to focus on to get out in front, and we could actually get the reagents here in the state quicker so that we can turn around those tests to Oklahomans within 24 hours. Trey Savage, you can ask a question. Um, yeah. Uh, Governor, can you, uh, or uh, Dr. Shrum, uh, maybe as well, can you speak to the uh, value uh, that is, the, the efforts that are being undertaken by OSU? And I, I joined just a few minutes late, I'm so sorry, uh, but so maybe you, you already talked about this, but if you could talk a little bit about the specific labs, the federal um, approval you had to get, uh, and the, the role that the that OSU is specifically playing in this effort. Yes, yeah, so as as uh, under under this emergency condition, the federal government allowed for uh, certain waivers in order to bring uh, external testing sites that were research laboratories underneath the state health department to expand our, our existing capabilities. And so, as I said, we, we got together, really looked at a strategy of, first of all, what labs actually in, in, in Oklahoma had the capability, had the equipment to, to run these uh, tests that we needed, and what was the platforms, the companies, where were they getting the supplies. Um, and what we found uh, was that there Amongst our three labs, there's a variety of different platforms, um, but OSU has the capability to do uh, automated testing, which means high throughput, meaning that in other labs you have to manually uh, uh, create the reagent and put it in the, into the test. Uh, OSU has two automated machines that allows them to do this very quickly, and they were also utilizing a platform that we believed we could get the reagents quickly on. And so we executed very quickly to do that. OSU has been great in transitioning and working with us um, to put that in place. Uh, the State Health Department, uh, as well as the OU labs, all working together to put processes in place so that we can, we can process those labs and get them out. So it really was a matter of uh, what equipment was available, who was already doing high throughput testing, and, and how we could execute on that in, in a very quick manner. OSU, you are now open to ask a question. KOSU.
Okay, we'll go to Paul Money's. Hi, um, Secretary Lockridge, um, do you have a good idea of what the ideal number of ventilators are for this state? Uh, last count we had 751, uh, because uh, I just want to kind of see what, what details we might have and what we might need going forward as this gets a little bit harder to do. Um, Paul, I'm gonna I'm gonna infer that your question uh, was about I did hear ventilators, so let me uh, go with that. Uh, if we don't uh, hit the mark on that, we'll have you repeat the question. But uh, I believe the question was, how do we sit with respect to capacity on ventilators? So the state uh, has a store of about 800 uh, odd ventilators across the state. Um, we don't believe that that will necessarily, as they sit now, be sufficient, and therefore uh, are moving quickly, both from the state side. Uh, to source ventilation capacity for ICU beds, but as well um, the supply chains of existing hospitals and other medical centers are already underway. Uh, Dr. Shrum and I were at the University of Oklahoma OU Medicine yesterday. Uh, they have already amped up their own supply chains uh, to meet what we believe will be the forthcoming demand on ventilator capacity. So I would say this, much like testing, is uh, a multipartite attempt uh, to make sure that we have adequate supply at such a time as we need them. So I'd say that that's well underway. We don't anticipate like any other state uh, or any other locality that as we sit now there would be sufficient uh, as they sit in the hospitals, uh, but neither have we been waiting. That's been underway uh, now for days, that effort to make sure that we have ventilation capacity. This question is from KOSU. Uh, Secretary Lofrich, you mentioned starting satellite testing sites in northwest and southwest Oklahoma. When will those roll out, and what counties will they be located in? Those will be in the next uh, four days, and we're going to hold tight before stipulating exactly where they are. Um, again, we're going to try to make sure we reach the northwest part, northwest most part of the state and the southwest most part of the state. Uh, but if you'll allow us a little bit of time to make sure folks on the ground are prepared for that to come their way, we'll be happy to share details with you uh, really in the, next, uh, in the next 24 hours to be sure. Randy Crable, you are open for a question. I understand that, uh, well, you'd mentioned earlier that uh, you're, gonna, you're paying uh, more attention to the modeling, you're looking at the modeling. And I think some other people have raised questions about that. So what are what are the some of the specific um, problems or potential weaknesses you see in the modeling that the state has been using? Well, I wouldn't say there's been any specific uh, problems uh, that the state's been using. We're still getting our arms around as this is changing so rapidly as we've getting more and more tests come online as we're watching what uh, uh, what's happening in, in other states and other countries those factors all feed into our model uh, and so really we're, we're just trying to finalize where we think our peak is going to be uh, when we think we're peak, our peak is going to be and that will drive our decision making on hospital beds icu ventilators the ppe burn rates that we're going to be looking at our ordering everything falls off of where we're going to where we're going to kind of land on the modeling side so they're working on it we're challenging that's why i wanted more eyes and uh more uh, more focus around it i've talked to other governors on how they're modeling their state needs uh, so we're right in the middle of that right now and uh and we're at the same time we're following the cdc guidelines we ramped up some of my executive orders la uh, earlier in the week uh, to continue to flatten the curve as we are trying to give us time to build up our PPE and uh, and, and our eventual needs uh, in the uh, in the hospital capacity. Rick Marinon with Fox 23. Governor, I've got a quick example. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. We can hear you just fine. Okay. I've got a quick example, and then I'll ask my question. I won't take too much of your time. Um, sorry, we've got the dog here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have an auction house in East Tulsa that has packed 50 plus people in for an auction today for used cars. They are listed as essential under your order, um, but at the same time, it's violating the group of 10 um, order part of the order as well. I'm wondering if you think your essential list is too big uh, and, and too, I guess, friendly to too many businesses to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. 
So we are following the federal guidelines on what is an essential and a non-essential business. And over the last couple of days, we've given more clarification to that because there was a lot of, uh, um, we just were getting tons and tons of questions for what is an essential and non-essential. But first off, we're following the federal guidelines. Uh, secondly, if there are businesses that are, are gathering with 10 or more, uh, that is in a violation. And so uh, they, if they are an essential, it doesn't mean that they should gather with 10 or more people in groups. They have to spread out. They've got to do stuff online. Um, that's been our directive across, the country, across our state. And I know that's the directive from the president across the country as well. Erica Stanish. Yes, my question is, what really has taken Oklahoma so long to get enough testing kits and to set up these mobile locations? I mean, compared to other states and just a survey done on New York Times today, we're second to last in the country right now compared to other states. I mean, it, to me, I feel like we need to be trying to get these as soon as we can. Um, so what has just taken so long for Oklahoma? Well, I would say, first of all, we, you know, we've seen uh, the outbreak occur in other states quicker. And um, as we started going through our reagents, um, and, you know, you have to recognize that through FEMA is where the state was getting their supply of reagents. And so as other states are hit more quickly, uh, the supply chain tightens down, and um, while we might be promised um, reagent, we might not be first in line to get that. It could have been delayed. And so, um, to, to be honest, when we recognized that we were having those challenges, um, our turnaround time in getting reagent was very, very quick through the commercial side. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of our team and stand behind the work that they did in getting the testing capabilities up and running. You also have to recognize that, you know, it's a fluid situation and we're following federal guidelines. And so once they loosened those uh, regulations and allowed us to identify external labs, which expanded the platforms that we were using and therefore the reagents that we could go after, we executed very, very quickly. Dylan Richards with KOCO. Hey folks, hopefully you can hear me this time. I'm just having audio issues. Um, my question was about, I know we're looking at these mobile testing sites and, and uh, the fairgrounds right now, I know is Oklahoma City County Health Department's deal, but maybe one of the secretaries knows, but what is the timeline? What is the plan to bring that type of um, drive-through testing that's kind of open to the public uh, to the metros? Okay, uh, thanks for the question, Dylan. Um, we will continue to prioritize those people um, who do exhibit symptoms uh, certainly those who are in the highest risk categories, that is, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, the elderly, age 65 and older, and those with compromised immune systems, uh, as well as, of course, the hospitalized. So those will continue to be the priority. Uh, we would not want the public to have uh, the notion that if, uh, you know, someone simply isn't feeling good, that they ought to go, uh, you know, use one of these critical tests. Again, uh, we've done incredible work on increasing our test capacity, but we still must be judicious in its application, such that it's safe for those people who are really in need and who exhibit the symptoms of the type that warrant uh, the use of some of these precious resources. Um, all that being said, um, I think that we will, as testing capacity becomes available, we will continue to push those out both into the metro areas, but also into rural areas. We try to keep a supply in each of our county locations uh, that they can draw on, um, and some of them, even as we speak, uh, are using what could be styled uh, drive-by uh, methodologies for getting people swabbed and then ultimately testing. Uh, we our, our priority through all of this is to make sure that our health care workers' safety and health is preserved. Uh, again, we can't emphasize enough to the extent our collective efforts at social distancing and personal hygiene protect the frontline healthcare worker, we will have done our job on both flattening the curve and preserving our healthcare capacity for when the surge actually hits. I would also add to that that in the metropolitan areas, you will likely see as more testing capability comes available, not just through the state, but through the private labs that the health systems will also uh, implement on their own testing sites. Uh, Randy Ellis. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Uh, one, we're, we're hearing that perhaps there's a whole lot more people in the hospitals uh, with a COVID ID than the numbers, at least by the state health department, reflect, uh, possibly because they're reserving tests. Uh, they don't figure it's going to make much chance, uh, much change in the way they 
treat the person. Uh, do you have a sense of that? That's my first question. Well, I think what uh, we have been tracking, um, what we would call um, persons under investigation, and we know that we have we have patients that are hospitalized that are suspected to have COVID. Uh, what you have to understand in early on uh, when the testing capabilities, before we recognize that, we got a backlog. So some, some individuals that are in the hospital that meet, meet criteria to be tested, and again, we're going to trust those healthcare professionals that are in that facility. I, I fully believe that, you know, if there is a patient that they suspect, they want, them, they want those patients tested. Uh, but what, what, what happened is uh, some of those got sent out of state, which is, and there's a delayed time in return on some of those uh, lab tests. And so what we're trying to do is increase the capability and the capacity inside the state so we can turn those around within 24 hours. So that is that, that goes back to the testing priorities uh, that I stated earlier, being the hospitalized patients, the vulnerable population, and the healthcare workers. Is it your sense that there's maybe as many as 600 or something that are hospitalized with the virus right now? Or? Uh, we don't have that that many confirmed. The um, we are monitoring the number of um, labs pending, um, but I, I don't. I, I I could probably get back to you on that number. But my sense is that we're not at 600 at this point in time. Secretary Lothridge, do you have any other data? Right. I thought it was closer to uh, 300 that was pending in the hospitals and we're waiting. And just to clarify uh, your question, so so they are tested. If they're in there and the healthcare providers want, uh, think that they have the symptoms of COVID-19, they are tested. This is why the testing in state is so important because we're waiting for seven days as some of those are, went out of state. That's why it was such a big game changer to get those 10,000 uh, test kits in our state because we want to make sure uh, we can get those tested immediately. Uh, we know who is positive and who's negative. That also saves on PPE because our health professionals having to go in and take care of those patients if, we, if we're not positive. Um, what they are, it's also burning through the protective equipment as well. Yeah, and it's that's a very illustrative of the nationwide kind of shortage and demand for reagent, uh, and and how much um, everyone is is utilizing that and and sending those labs out of state. Um, we we want to make Oklahomans a priority and do it right here. This will be the final question, Carmen Foreman. Um, yeah, I. I'm just curious, um, I assume that either the State Department of Health or Oklahoma State University had to pay for these 10,000 test kits in some way or another. And so I, I, it's sort of a two-part question. I'm curious how much we paid for those. And two, is that how Oklahoma is sort of getting ahead of some of the other states on this? Are we paying more? Is, it, or is this sort of turning into a bidding war in a, in a way? No, it, it's not turning into a, a bidding war. I think we were fortunate, uh, as I stated earlier, that that OSU already had a contract with Thermo Fisher because they were already utilizing um, their platforms in their labs and doing testing there. Um, and so we were able to expand and be prioritized our orders uh, through OSU to allow us to increase our capacity to do testing through the state health department. 